evidence-based medicine. We throw that term all the time during rounds, during clinical work. Today, I'm going to give a tutorial about evidence-based medicine. How do you apply it as a medical educator? How do you incorporate it into your rounds? How do you teach your students and how do you think about evidence-based medicine. So let's dive right in. In this tutorial today, we will be talking about evidence-based medicine and about critical appraisal. These are the four things. What is evidence-based medicine? What is critical appraisal? What sort of common biases we see all the time? And then finally, how to apply evidence-based medicine to your patient. This is a wonderful definition from David Sackett, the father of evidence-based medicine. It is basically the integration of best research evidence with clinical experience in patient values. So look at this Venn diagram here. You want evidence and you want to in in integrate it with clinical experience and patient's values. So let's start with why is it important? It's important for you as a doctor because your patients trust you. You know how to, you can, you know how to navigate media information and you can guide them. Number two, it helps you make a decision when choosing a treatment. It helps facilitate counseling. Think about your prognosis, your risk factors. It also facilitates shared decision-making between you and your patient. So that way you know the pros and cons of a treatment. Personal benefit. When you are able to integrate evidence-based medicine, other doctors start trust, trusting you. As a consultant, you get more referrals. You have more confidence when you're discussing plans with other specialties. You also get more authority. So think about clinical guidance committee. Here I'm giving like legal, these are kidney-related committees, but when you know how to use evidence-based medicine, committee members, a lot of committees, they want somebody to give their comments on some sort of new policies. So you are able to integrate these evidence a bit better. Finally, it is important for you as a teacher because now you can start incorporating it in your teaching runs. So why is it challenging? It is challenging because there's an explosion of scientific information. There is limited time for the busy clinician to read all the articles. And you need knowledge on how to understand the studies, how to access the literature, there is publication bias, and there is also conflict of interest. Let's talk about the five A's of evidence-based medicine. First, you assess, you ask, you acquire, appraise, and then you apply. So assess what? You assess the clinical problem. Then you ask the research question, you acquire the evidence, you appraise the evidence. And this is a small section where we talk about critical appraisal of research paper or any form of information. And then finally, you apply to your patient. So let's dive deeper into critical appraisal. Based on the Cambridge Dictionary, appraisal means an examination of the value, condition, and qualities of something. So in a research sense, we are doing a critical appraisal. We are looking at the value of the research study and the quality. What are we looking at? And then when you talk about property appraisals, you appraise it and then you give value to a house based on how many rooms, the location, what is the value, what's the condition, and the quality of the house. Similarly, in research paper, you're examining all the different components of a research paper. So let's dive deeper. What is critical appraisal? It looks at the way a study is conducted and it examines factors such as validity. In other words, is it logically sound? You think, is it legit, right? Is it trustworthy? Is there value? Is it relevant? Is it generalizable? So how do you appraise an article? So first thing is, we'll go through five things. First is, what is a research question? I have a separate video linked up here about what research question is. Then we ask, what is the study design? Is the result valid? What are the results and will the results help locally? Okay, since we have a separate video research question, now we're going to dive straight into what is the study design. Okay, so when you talk about study design, there are two main questions as you're reading a research paper. Number one, what is the level of evidence? And number two, did the, the, the authors use the right study design to answer the research question? All right, so this is a level of evidence, and I am sure a lot of you would have seen this, where there's this pyramid, and then level five is at the bottom. So at the bottom, it says animal and lab studies. This one does not involve humans. Then the next level, case reports, case series, or narrative review. There's no study design. It's just a summary. Case control studies and cohort study. These are observational studies. Randomized control trial. This is ex experimental. And then you have meta-analysis and systematic review. This is secondary, and then a they are, you're appraising the study and then collecting into one. The problem with this pyramid is that it only tells, it only tells half the story. So just because it's at the bottom of the pyramid doesn't mean that it's less important, doesn't mean that it's less meaningful, 
but basically it answers different questions. Each type serves a different role. And so I don't want people who think that, oh, just because it's a case report is less valuable, just because it's an animal lab studies is less valuable, or everything needs to have a randomized control trial. And that's not true because randomized control trial is only comparing two different interventions. And on the right here, now you can ask, can, can a randomized control trial tell you the incidence rate of a condition? No, you need a cohort study. Can, can an RCT tell you the risk factors of condition? No, you need cohort study, you need case, case control studies, and can a randomized control trial, if a diagnostic test of that, if it if a diagnostic test is valid for clinical condition, no, you need a case control study. So the reason I'm not the reason I'm focusing on this is because a lot of people, when they're reading research paper, just because it's not an RCT, they think it's not valuable. They really these have different purposes and different study designs are meant to answer the different questions. Okay, so what are the different types of study questions they are? Number one, the extent of the problem. You want to know, I just want to know what's the problem, right? So that you, for example, how many people have diabetes? How many people have complication from this medication? That will be a cross-sectional study. You just want to know the extent of the problem. You can use cross-sectional or a cohort study. Next, you want to know the diagnosis. How many people have this diagnosis? Then you do a case control study or a cohort study. Next, treatment. So treatment, this one, the best way to compare treatment is randomized controlled trial. Or sometimes if it is not ethical, then you may not be able to do a randomized controlled trial. And now a cohort study would be better. Now you have to use different statistical method to, to compare the two groups. Next, you want to know the prognosis of a condition. Here, you can use a randomized controlled trial and then you follow them up some, for some time. Or if it's a condition where you want to look at them under natural condition and you're not giving any intervention, you use a cohort study. Number five, harm. What are the complications that can occur to a patient? What are the side effects that can occur when somebody takes this medication? That you need long-term follow-up, so a cohort study will be better. Okay, so now you have matched the research question to the study design. The next question, is the result valid? Okay, so what's the definition of validity? It is the quality of be being based on, the tr on truth or reason, or the quality of being logically or factually sound. Let's talk about reliability versus validity of the tool. The reliability is the degree to which a measurement instrument produces stable and consistent result. Okay, so let me give you an example. When we start had, first had COVID, right, there were a lot of home kit swaps, and you don't know whether it's reliable or not, because maybe one kit says it's positive, another one says negative, another says positive. So you want a reliable instrument. The next one is validity. The validity is the degree to which an instrument measures what it is supposed to measure. Is it the truth? So this is a figure we commonly see, okay? If it's reliable, it's very consistent, okay? It's not valid because it's not close to the truth, the red, the bull's eye. The second one is valid, but not reliable. We can see that it's, it's all around the truth, but they're all so spread out. So it's not reliable, it's not consistent. Sometimes it's right over here, sometimes it's right over there. The third one, neither reliable or valid. It's far away from the truth and it's all over the place. And finally, only when it's both, only when it's close to the truth, that's valid and reliable because it's all consistently right in the middle. Let me give you an example because it, when I keep using words like val validity, reliability, without looking at some examples, it's difficult to, to understand this. Let's say you saw a research study and it says the definition of chronic kidney disease, right? A patient who has three out of the eight below will be defined as having stage three chronic disease. They need to have either headaches, chest pain, shortness of breath, blood in the urine, tiredness, low of black pain, one eGFR value less than 60, and urine protein. So here I'm giving you a very extreme example that this is not valid because this is not how you diagnose stage three chronic kidney disease. And that way, you know, it's not valid because it's far away from how we define and diagnose stage three chronic kidney disease. As you're reading through the paper, I want you to start looking at each diagnosis. How did they define it? Is it a valid way? Is this the standard of how the societies are, are defining the medical condition? Now you have three questions answered. And the fourth one is what are the results? You've looked at the method section. You've looked at the introduction section to look at the research question. You have looked at the method section to look at the study design and the study design. Finally, let's look at the study results. Okay, so what are the results? First question you really care about is to trustworthiness. 
Is the result answering the research question? Are they interpreting the results properly? Is the result clinically important? And what is the net impact? And what do I mean by that is, yeah, it could improve, but is it causing a lot of more problems? For example, this drug increases life expectancy for three months, but has numerous side effects. The next point is, look at the figures and the tables. Sometimes it could be misrepresentation of the graph. Maybe the scale is too big, too small, or maybe skip numbers. The graph isn't labeled properly. So the data is left out. You want to be really, you want to look into the details. So now let me give you an example here. Sometimes certain graphs, if you look at here at the bottom, if you don't look at the axis properly, you may think, oh, it's zero, right? But when you zoom in, you can see, ah, I see it starts at 35,000. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you need to make sure you're looking at the labels properly. Okay. So now we have looked at the results, the written section, the tables, the figures, and now let's also look at the discussion section. The discussion is really about how are you applying the results in this study to the field in general. And the question you're asking is the result consistent with other studies? And so the one on the left, the research, and you want to compare with existing res evidence. And two other questions you want to ask, is the result discordant with other studies or different from other studies? And if so, why? And how did the author justify it? The next question, is the result surprising? And sometimes like, oh, it is a very interesting finding. And if it's surprising, why? What are the possible reasons? Because you need to make sure it, it matches up with existing evidence. Even if the authors are trying to dispute previous evidence, they need to explain why. Now, the next question, will the results help locally? And so there are three questions, validity versus generalizability versus applicability. Let's go through one at a time. The first one is internal validity. Are the results valid? within the population being studied? Or in other words, can I trust the study? The next question, external, because initially is you want to first trust the material, okay? Once you trust it, then you can ask the next question. Can it, is there external validity? Can I generalize it to other population? And it only counts when there is internal validity in your paper. And now once you've had that, you ask, are the results one de once determined to be valid, generalizable to other populations? Then the final one, applicability. Does it apply to a particular patient of mine? Now, one more point about generalizability of the study population. Are the results, once determined to be valid again, is it, gener is it generalizable to other population? And how do you look at And what do you look at? You look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Who did they include? Who did they exclude? You want to also look at the table one, usually the demographic table. You want to look at the age, the comorbidities. Does it look like the population you take care of? So let's talk about applying evidence-based medicine to your patient. So as a recap, what is EBM? The integration of the best research evidence with clinical experience and patient values. So we talked about evidence. Now let's integrate clinical experience and patient values here. All right, so the first question, compared to the study population, is your patient of the similar age group? Is their race and ethnicity represented? Are they of similar risk factors or comorbid condition? And where do you find this information? Again, go back, look at the inclusion exclusion criteria, look at the table one, look at the baseline characteristics table. Next question, how did the study diagnose or define the clinical condition? How certain are you that the patient has this clinical condition? Is the definition or diagnostic method for this clinical condition used in the study method, is it similar? Is it valid or feasible in your institution? Is a clinical condition of similar severity with your patient? For example, let's say this study only studied patient with acute kidney injury that required dialysis, but your patient has only mild elevation in serum creatinine, then it's not as applicable. And again, where do you find this information? Method section. And you look specifically at the definition of the medical condition. Is it a standard definition or something the authors decided for themselves? How did they measure the outcome or exposure? Think about lab work and imaging studies. And also the study intervention. Can your institution even deliver the intervention in, this, in the same manner or in an effective manner? So for example, if this study 
describes a very complex way, a citrate anticoagulation protocol for a chronic replacement ter therapy. Oh, and they said, oh, it's the best way. But can your institution even do the same thing? Another example, this, another question, does your patient have any contraindication for the proposed intervention? The list of side effects, is it particularly detrimental to your patient? Now you've read the whole paper. What if you can't find a study that perfectly fits your patient? It is more common than you think because sick patients get excluded from clinical trials all the time. Some conditions are underrepresented in certain race, ethnicity, or countries. For example, IgA nephropathy is really more commonly seen in the Asian population. Now that we have incorporated research evidence to our clinical experience, now let's move on to incorporating research evidence to patient values. This is really important for shared decision making. Is the study outcome meaningful to your patient? So think about prolonging life versus quality of life. One example, we know that adding an ACE inhibitor reduces proteinuria in chronic kidney disease progression. And you have this 85 year old patient with stage three CKD. And so now the question is, do I want to give this medication to the patient? Do they even care about the reduction in proteinuria? Maybe it may be good for him because he, other than being age 85, he is otherwise healthy. Or maybe not. He may have multiple medical condition and is really trying to cope with 25 medications and has hyperkalemia. So this medication is not for him. Other questions to ask, does the intervention come with too many side effects? Is the intervention too expensive? And additional challenges when you're trying to incorporate evidence to patient values. One is patients sometimes do not want to participate in shared decision making, and they are really deferring decision to the doctor. So you have to use your best judgment here. Next one is they may want to defer decision to family members. They may trust other sources, information from Facebook, who knows. And you may have to explain the risks and benefits as best as you can, and then just meet them where they are. So. And to summarize what is evidence-based medicine, remember it's integration of best research evidence with clinical experience and patient values. We first talked about appraising the evidence. Then we talked about how to integrate the evidence to clinical experience. And then finally, integrating evidence to patient values. All right, there you have it. So if you have more questions and comments, anything about evidence-based medicine, put a comment below and I'll try my best to answer you. I'll see you next time.